Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I am back. I am back from, well, like the cage that I've created of my own hell, of my own doing. Yeah, I'm back from that. So thank you again to my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples for taking care of the podcast while I was gone. I literally cannot thank you enough for for, for doing such an excellent job on that last episode. Uh, I was so like heart warmed and heart hurt that I couldn't be a part of that because I'm just like, it's kind of like, okay, it's that gif of that old man putting his hand to the glass and like crying a little bit. That was me <laughs> as I was, as I was listening to last week's episode. Mm-hmm, so a mm-hmm. uh, huge thank you to both of you for doing that. Like you're, you're both amazing and awesome. Uh, so yeah, I'm coming out of the fugue state that are finals and I will be back. Although that might happen again at some point. I don't know how true that's going to be, but we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, enough of my preamble. We got a podcast to do. We've got all sorts of cool stuff to do. But before we get into that, let's remind everyone that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, where you can click the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, we're over on Twitter at Let's World Build. And of course, if you want to come join our Discord, there's a link for that in the description and that's realistically where you can come and hang out with us and, and chat more directly. Uh, don't be a bot and try and like spam shit, though, because we will immediately kick you. That's th- that's somehow been an issue lately, but whatever. Anyway, don't be a bot. Come to our Discord and be really cool folks. And speaking of really cool folks, guess what? If you want to come and join our Patreon and provide us with a monetary thing that we can, you know, like as a thank you or like as a, hey, good job, like a little tip, you can do so by supporting us over on Patreon. Link for that in the description of this episode and on our website. But with all of that out of the way, we've got a new prompt from a new listener. So our first time submitter, Andrew. First of all, Andrew, thank you for your prompt. Deeply appreciated. Uh, Your prompt sounds something like a post post-apocalyptic world centered around a brackish sea that rings the habitable twilight zone not the show by the or the terrible movie uh but it's like it's just you know like in between it's like an interstitial anyway the tenets number one some sort of event in the distant past has resulted in the world become entirely locked there is still some wobble but the world has no day night cycle remaining Number two, as most of the planet's water has been redistributed away from the sun-scorched daylight side of the planet, and much of the habitable ring is filled with brackish water, ice mining in the frozen side of the planet is an important source of saltless water. Number three, the society that existed before the tidal locking was very technologically advanced. Well, we've got a prompt. We get to dive right into it. So, Courtney... Take it away. What do you have for us for your very first tenant? And right I, after Daniel yep. tells us his tenant, yep. of course. Yeah, of course. because I, I didn't forget. Yep. I've been gone, but I didn't forget. <laughs> Daniel, what do you got for us? Uh, for this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too Daniel, excited. Daniel's <laughs> enthusiasm is off the charts for this no, one. I, yeah. I like the prompt. It's science fiction-y. <laughs> um, I was reading a little bit about tidal locking to understand it fully. but Good. I'm glad that somebody did that because I, I yes. didn't. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I understand it fully yeah. as scientists, but, you know, my, my sci-fi reading of it. <laughs> I fully anticipated Daniel to do some scientific research. So that's my minor, like, dumb shit. So you know. <laughs> um, in this prompt, I wanted to say that it, no one sleeps in this world since there's no day night cycle no. and sleep mm. is a myth of the past. Interesting. Huh? Okay, first of all, self-report from Daniel, who also doesn't sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but also, like, okay, w- there's got to be something else at play here, right? Because there are places in the world as they are right now that also don't really have a day-night cycle, depending on how close you are to the the equator or the poles, rather. So, like, what what has happened in this past that 
sleep is no longer necessary? Is it some kind of like a bio change as well? Or are you, are you just banking on the fact that it's day night cycle has prevented that kind of diurnal nature? In my reading, it was suggested that a tidally locked planet could cause this to happen. Um, I assume not just because of a lack of daylight, but because that their the rhythm of the body would be changed. Interesting. How would that like biologically though? Because we kind of need sleep to survive. So we like, do yeah. indeed. Yeah, we kind of like die it, without it. I'm assuming <laughs> it's the result of evolution of some kind. So yeah. you know, like for example, ants don't sleep. You know, um, so. It, it's possible for creatures to be that way. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder then like what that period, that adaptation period was like, if like, was there, Horrible. Right? Yeah. was there mass <laughs> die off from like people not being able to sleep anymore and like only the, the strong survive kind of thing. And that's why they evolved in this manner. Yeah. Well, I imagine, I mean, I imagine to your point, like there's probably some form of rest because like, Ants don't sleep in the way we understand, but they mm. sort of shut down for moments. But I, what I'm imagining here is whatever sort of recharging they do is not sleep in the way that we do it. And mm. it's not like gotcha. I'm inactive and incapable of doing anything, you know, for a period. Yeah, like more of like a, a meditation mm. type thing or like a half sleep or something where you sort of shut down, but you're still capable of doing like basic tasks. Um, yeah, maybe, I, I guess I just want to avoid like sleep by another name. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah if it is like, I, I would say meditation is basically sleep when it comes down to it, because you can't do right. anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I would, so maybe something like, um, it may be, for example, like, you know, when you're distracted and you're not paying attention to a conversation, mm -hmm. you can go someplace else. Yeah. Like, could be <laughs> like that. I'm just thinking like so, something that's not like, oh, it's just another color for sleep, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we're we're trying to avoid sleep entirely, right? Is what you're suggesting, yeah. Daniel. So so for example, a technological workaround where you're like tossed into a pod for an hour and then you're back at it, like you want to avoid that as well. Yeah, because that's basically sleep. <laughs> so, yeah. No, that's that's what I'm trying to get at. I want to make sure yeah, that like exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because the need for sleep and a lack of sleep are two entirely different things, right? Like mm -hmm. okay. Interesting. Gotcha. Like they don't need sleep, is my point. Yeah, I kind of right. like the image of like, I don't know, like your thinking brain is asleep, but you're still capable of like walking around and and doing basic mm. things. It's just like you're not fully there. Like if if somebody were to ask you a question, you might just completely ignore it. Part of yeah. your brain just isn't comprehending what's going on. I'm, I'm not going to lie. This sounds like a straight up fucking horror movie to me. <laughs> like <laughs> the idea that you're like trapped in a never ending like awake cycle, like in a, a wide awake nightmare constantly like because sleep isn't just about you know like physical rest it's also about like the ability to stop thinking for just a moment right so without that like oh god you're, you're just gonna have to shut your brain off in some other way so there might be some kind of interesting bit where it's it's kind of like um uh what's that oh severance right yeah, yeah where like your your body is still active and like working but like that part of your brain is like dimmed mm -hmm. pretty pretty deeply or like maybe like the sunken place or something where you, you become more Ooh, of a like passenger that. where you're, you're a passenger to your body's experience you go someplace than... else. that's kind of cool yeah yeah for a time yeah that's again still or horrif absolutely horrifying to me <laughs> like i i hate everything about it but it's very interesting so uh i think i've tapped into a weird phobia of mine by talking about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well i suppose that it's it's been a while so i might as well provide you with my first tenet so the the prompt says that it was pretty technologically advanced and as someone who's currently in a prison of their own design and in a hell of their own making i've decided that i wanted to express that through one of my own tenets in that the brackish water the brackish sea the event is entirely their fault and i'm mm -hmm. going to say this not because like oh it was a giant war actually what they were trying to do is harness the tidal uh currents as like an energy source, right? Mm -hmm. So they were they were trying to create what were effectively like massive trenches in underground or undersea, I suppose, like dams that eventually slowed the water to a standstill. And there's no way that they've been able to find out thus far how to cause that current to start up again. 
So a uh, nightmare of their own making. That's what I wanted to provide. And I feel like, you know, giving them a good reason, like renewable energy. I thought that was kind of a fun way to kind of push it in a way that's like not boring and warlike as a result. No, I like that a lot. Because, yeah, I had been I hadn't really fully pictured what event it would be, but sort of imagined it being a natural event. But I like the take that it's actually their own doing, mm. however many thousands of years ago or whatever it was. Um, mm. And that does mean then that there's like potentially a fix for it at some point if they can figure it out. Potentially. But but yeah, right now it's about like adapting mostly, yeah. you know, Surviving. I, I also like the idea that the legacy of this thing is like. There are massive underground or under damn it, undersea like walls and trenches mm. of these like man-made things, you know, especially because I imagine that there's going to be some of these on the sun scorched half of the earth. So you see these massive monuments to, you know, their failure and their hubris. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. That's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with that completely. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like. <laughs> Just the whole concept of like geoengineering can be sort of a, a scary one. Like how much can you change your planet before right. it really backfires? And or it stops rotating. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I, I think in, and this might be misinformation or disinformation, but I'm pretty sure that like the, the wind currents of the earth have changed since we've started to use like uh, wind power stuff like that, which is also like, kind of scary and a little weird at the same time you know that like oh yeah we can just do that if we make a concerted enough effort to do it you know yeah i don't know if it's based on like use of wind power i thought it was more like uh basically the climate is shifting to the point where like the jet stream is changing because of uh, the way that hot and cold air are interacting basically right. the yeah everything's kind of shifting around because mm. of that yeah, I'm not a weather scientist, so I could be completely mm. off base on yeah. that one, you know? Yeah. It also <laughs> raises questions about what this, I mean, this is for later, what this planet is tidally locked to, like what other object, you know, whether it's another planet or is this a moon of a planet? Uh, uh, okay. I see, I see. I, th I think that there's some mention of a moon in that, or, or maybe it, maybe that was just what I was thinking of. Hold on. I don't think. No, there's no. I mean, oh, yeah. Locked to the star, I suppose. But yeah, that's what I was picturing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, okay, I just realized: is this a moonless planet that we have? Oh, maybe. Because because like the moon also has a lot to do with like the churning of the water. So maybe one of the things that makes this planet like prone to this thing from the beginning is this idea that there's no moon to also pull the tides mm -hmm. to and from and stuff like that. Cause that, that's kind of an interesting idea to think of as well, I think. Yeah, that could be the case. And we could also take that to in a direction of like, that is their own doing. Like they, maybe they were harvesting resources from the moon <laughs> and they basically mined it into non-existence. <laughs> you bastards, you blew up the moon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and I mean, I, 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 we can sort it out over time, but it, it would seem that the conditions are caused by the planet not rotating anymore. Like it's facing whatever it's orbiting, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't rotate. So it's it's orbiting the object without itself oh. spinning. That's yeah. that's what the tidal locking is. But like that could be caused, like Rob was saying, by somehow messing with the interior of the planet and then stopping its rotation, like messing up its gravitational balance. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Oh, OK. I mean, we can, we can kind of peanut butter jelly this shit if we just mm -hmm. say like, hey, where do you get enough resources to create giant, you know, like trenches that are able oh, to block? They mine the moon. They, you literally mine the yeah. moon. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so they maybe the moon the had moon. maybe the moon had some kind of um, material that was helpful, like a special kind of metal or regolith. And mm -hmm. they reuse mm -hmm. that resource in building this machine. Yeah. yeah or, or it's like inherently magnetic or polarized yeah. in a way. But by yeah. bringing so much of it in this particular car, oh, it fucked up the rotation. Configuration. It fucks yeah. up the rotation. Yeah, yeah there exactly. you go. There you go. And yeah. that's science for you. Whoever yes, I know yeah. wrote this deeply understands <laughs> how this works, and now he hates us. Yeah, uh, we're, we're sorry, Andrew. Get. We we are not scientists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, getting my master's in English. So <laughs> you know, you have three people whose degrees are not science. Yep. Nowhere yeah. near science. <laughs> If you want science, you get, you make sure that we give this on a Clark episode, okay? <laughs> well, you, here's what I do have to say about that. 
I don't care because it's science oh, fiction, yeah. so we can tweak it until it'll work. So yeah, that's right. when you when you talk to the scientists, and you're like, "What about this?" And he's like, "Well, that's really dumb. You have to have X, Y, and Z." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I'm going to incorporate those things in this way, and fuck you. Now it works." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel emphasizes the science; we emphasize the fiction. Like that's kind of yeah. that's kind of how it goes. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Daniel, uh, Courtney, why don't you go ahead and start us off with your first tenet? <laughs> All right. Um, so I just watched the movie Pitch Black for the first time. Oh, oh with, Vin, with Vin with Vin Diesel with Vin Diesel in wow. preparation for this prompt because I knew that it had to deal with like a sun scorched planet. Yep, and, and pitch black night cycles. Sure, yes. absolutely. Yes. Uh, and inspired by that, my first tenet is that there are <laughs> extended eclipses that temporarily make it much easier for people to explore the sun side uh, of the planet. Nice. Um, I was picturing expeditions to like the ancient ruins to gather that technology. Um, but there could also be, you know, searches for why this happened in the first place and how we can uh, reverse it and stuff like that. And since, since we don't have moons anymore, <laughs> I, I'm thinking that it's planets that line up and cause these oh, gotcha. eclipses between okay, cool. the sun and this planet. That Excellent. is dope. Courtney, I'd like to let you know that the first time I saw Pitch Black was with your boyfriend back in like 2001 or 2002, whenever that movie came out. We rented it from a video store, which existed back in the day. And uh, yes, yeah, we watched it together. I I specifically remember watching it with your boyfriend. So nice, nice. shout out to one of my oldest friends. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I mean... That's really cool because now what that allows us to do is how, how reliable are these cycles, by the way? How reliable are the eclipses? I'm I'm guessing pretty on time every mm. I don't know how yeah. often they would occur, but that was my next question. How frequent are they? Yeah, because in, in the movie it was every like 22 years or something. Right. Oh wow. Yeah. I forgot about that. Mm. So I I don't know. It could I feel like it could be any amount of time. Mm. Like if it's more rare, then I guess that would make those expeditions even more like high stakes. Right. Yeah. I like rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was, I was thinking that like, if it's reliable and if it's frequent enough, then you can effectively create like a, a vocation or like, mm -hmm. you know, like we know that once a year for one week, there's an opportunity to explore these normally forbidden areas or normally mm -hmm. like really inhospitable areas. But how how much more infrequent would you like them? Because if Daniel wants rare, like mm -hmm. Daniel, are you thinking like once every 10 years, once every hundred years? Like, what are we thinking here? Um, I mean, we could have a mixture. So, for example, if there's multiple planets, they can have different, you know, different revolutions. Right. Mm -hmm. So it could be that one that really aligns and covers like the whole face of the um Mm, the burnt yeah. or that side could be uh, super rare, but others like they only give a partial shielding or something. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Or it's like um partial shielding for most of those eclipses, but when the planets align in a perfect way, it becomes this like black. a total eclipse of the heart. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maximal <laughs> alignment. Now, I don't know if this makes sense at all, like in terms of actual yeah. alignment, but I'm thinking that would be kind of cool cares? if it does, you know, like if it's full it alignment. Cool. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. Like a full a full alignment means the entire right. half of the well, planet is capable planet of being explored. Be but like individual planets would only allow like certain regions and stuff like that. Yeah. So there'd be like a scramble to to see, you know, where they can go. That'd be mm -hmm. cool. I like see, that. Yeah, I think it's possible. Solar eclipses occur on the sun moon either fully or partially. So it's possible to have a partially partial eclipse. A partial yeah. eclipse of the heart? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I like that one as much. It's, it's like half as good as a normal karaoke song. You know? <laughs> because you know, on the one hand, like you know, we can I love how Daniel just completely ignores me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, whatever. Yeah, like shit, huh? <laughs> uh, I know. So on the one hand, you know, like um, I don't. I. I. We can hand wave a lot of stuff, but on the other hand, you don't want to like hand wave the central things. You know. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see. So Daniel, earlier when you said, you know how you just kind of like zone out when you're, you know, like when you're in conversations, you're not, <laughs> were you specifically talking about me just there? No, <laughs> I, I meant, no, I meant earlier, like for example, when we were, what were we talking about? We were talking about, um, before we start recording. Oh, oh, the post-apocalyptic Kansan landscape. Like <laughs> as, as you guys, both of you were talking, like I heard part of it and then like partially I'm sleep deprived, but then you then there was like a gap in my head and then i'm like as i was thinking about one thing you said earlier i'm like oh that's that's like the cinderella like yeah. evil, horrible and then you literally just said that you know? <laughs> that so it was sometimes. about me then <laughs> you were both of you. really <laughs> bold of you <laughs> 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 all right all right so so there's some there's some reality to this is what you're saying daniel is that of this course. is potentially possible okay it's possible it cool. seems like it's possible i'm looking at little pictures of parts of planets eclipsed so with shadows covering parts of the world so it sounds like okay. it can be done okay cool <laughs> uh great daniel you're gonna hit us with your second tenant now what do you got for us there um, I think this adds into what everyone has come up with pretty easily, but on the super hot side, which is virtually impossible to travel into there, unless you're, you know, unless it's an eclipse, there's a um, structure that belongs to the previous civilization that is partially still functioning. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, yeah, that absolutely works. You, you mean a structure beyond just the, the sea gates that they've created themselves, correct? Right, it's something that it's like some kind of important building or, or edifice that contains important knowledge about the previous. Gotcha. I'm just imagining this is like a sun bleached citadel at this point. Mm. I mean, like it's completely white due to constant yeah, bleaching. radiation and yeah. yeah, yeah, that works. Cool. It's going back to our uh, what was it, Land of a Thousand Suns, torture planet? <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah God, that was so brutal. <laughs> that yeah, was, that was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, do, do we need to kind of, do we want to push and figure out what that thing is now? Or do we want to see where the rest of the story kind of takes us first? I mean, I, I would rather just less add to it. It's a blank slate. I don't have any preconceptions Great. about it. Okay. I mean, if we're, if we're going with the pitch black reference, like Courtney is, going for this episode mm -hmm. i guess uh mm -hmm. then inside it's just a giant hive of monsters they're gonna target vin diesel and you yeah. know like yeah specifically vin <laughs> diesel of course yeah. um and his descendants vin diesel bees. okay this is my my brain is just similarly fried i'm just imagining vin diesel as a head in a jar on like a giant power mech and like fighting against the beast. And it's, I, I don't know. I'm moving on because otherwise my brain's just going to indulge in that. And I don't mm -hmm. want to do that. My second tenet, very simply put, is because there is so little inhabitable land, there is effectively a giant ring of civilization that is in a very thin strip of the world. So that that kind of twilight zone that that Andrew kind of talks about in the prompt that is the zone where most of life exists. And by life, I mean yeah. civilized life exists. And it is a thin ring that wraps around the entire globe. And, and everything's built really tall as well. So mm -hmm. if, depending on how technologically advanced we want to go, I'm thinking that can also be interstellar. So it's a literal ring world. But I also think that keeping it terrestrial is kind of more interesting to me mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of like what cities and countries look like when they're built on top of each other and built tall. I'm, I'm a big fan of that kind of structure. Interesting. I feel like I have to put my second tenant out now too, because it also has to deal with how people live. Oh, and to throw in another high quality movie inspiration here. I was picturing that this brackish sea twilight zone area was very water worldy with people mm. living on uh, ships and these constructed like rigs and mm -hmm. that sort of thing in in the actual sea because there there is so little actual land with all of the or most of the water in this region. Interesting. OK, how do we how do we <laughs> reconcile those two things? Because those are like. No, they're not directly competing, but there is some tension there that we need to fulfill. 
I think. I mean, what, what's fantastic is that this ring of civilization is like exactly what a tidally locked planet for demands, I think. Oh. Like there's a, there's a, I think they call it the Goldilocks zone, mm-hmm. where yeah. the habitable right. ring of the planet, where there's the hot side and the cold side. So so then, and, and the cold side, I assume, because that's where the water is melting, is the brackish part is in the ring, essentially. But I'm mm-hmm. assuming there might be gradations to, to bridge the gap. Mm-hmm. So perhaps like the very center that's the most temperate and ideal is where they've built all these structures and it's very tall. But mm. as you bleed further out towards mm. the freezing side, you could have Courtney's water world people, you know, who are not like they, they're adapting themselves to live under these extreme conditions um, more so. Mm. But they're not like a tightly knit civilization, say, as, as the middle is. So, so they're kind of like water world Vikings, effectively, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking mm. that yeah. If, she's, yeah. if she's up for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That sounds okay. awesome. <laughs> all right cool <laughs> i i like to imagine that there's like a, a certain level of um there's a certain level of self-satisfaction with those types of people who are like i'm off the grid i'm, I'm my own house <laughs> all libertarians you know, like, yeah like effectively right they're like i'm not up in those pampered towers with a roof over my head every night crammed in like you know like yeah. to them it represents freedom mm-hmm. right to, to be yeah. able to be on the the brackish sea and then to everyone who are in the towers like man they're fucking crazy they're gonna die and no one's gonna know <laughs> you know like it's that kind of push pull situation yeah i mean the thing there too is like um it is freedom in a way like freedom of being able to move around because the mm-hmm. one of the tenets does say that that ring is mostly filled with water so mm-hmm they would be able to like travel around a lot more freely than the people mm. who are in these more towery uh, types yeah. of buildings. Right. Right. Now mm. I'm picturing like these massive structures rising out of the brackish sea and the ring yeah. and, the, and the sea yeah. kind of bleeds out, you know, like, oh, it's frozen or burnt away. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I could see some of my water world people being like merchants who basically have these slow moving towns essentially that travel from like tower to tower trading sure. and, and stuff yeah. like that. So you do have the merchants and you do of course have to have the Vikings, you know, like the yeah, bad guys. The Raiders on jet skis. Uh, of course. <laughs> Ooh, jet skis. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Can we clear jet ski or would we have to settle for ski do maybe? How how is that going to work? It's <laughs> <laughs> oh uh okay similarly look because you brought up jet skis I now have to think in the ice wasteland, they're going to have like ski mobiles, right? Like that's, yeah. that's another thing that they're going to have too. Okay, cool. Just making, wait a minute. Jet skis that convert to ski mobiles. Uh, uh, like yep. There mm-hmm. we go. Got yeah. That's canon. <laughs> <laughs> it's canon. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like one of those cool GI Joe action figures that I had as yes. a kid, you know, it's like flips open, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh okay <laughs> cool so we've got we've got a pretty interesting world set up do we have any questions that we need to answer before we can continue on with our recap and then a twist i'm looking forward to the recap so i can remember all the tenants <laughs> um. <laughs> as you can clearly tell daniel's been half listening this entire episode <laughs> today I, I woke up and i'm like wow that's the first time i've had any real sleep in the past like six days Jesus because i Christ. swear well because i swear like sure i'm going to sleep forever really late like at four mm-hmm. or five in the morning but the problem is like i don't I'm not actually sleeping those six hours so so this morning i'm like i woke up i'm like oh that's what it's like to feel like i had slept i remember wow <laughs> but i should, still feel bad you should get more sleep you okay. should sleep more daniel <laughs> that seems like a thing you should do uh, i yes. will sleep when i'm dead <laughs> But you'll die sooner because of the lack of sleep. Exactly. Yeah. So that means I got to get a lot of shit done fast. It's, catch, <laughs> oh, it's catching yeah. up with you rapidly, Daniel. It is. Oh, yep. Daniel is like a climate change denier in <laughs> yes. that he denies sleep. <laughs> sleep when it's change like, denier. That thing's coming for us. We know uh-huh. it's coming. But I'm going to I'm gonna uh-huh. mine and strip mine the earth yes. as quickly as I can. Daniel, yeah. I didn't realize how filthy and disgusting you <laughs> are. It's, it's like Christ. it's like those those. Have you heard of these crazy AI apocalypse people who are like, eh, apocalypse is coming for AI, so I'm not gonna send my kids to school. Those are oh, real God. people. <laughs> what the hell? What? <laughs> yes. Oh well, okay. That's no different to me than like 
the 2012 preppers who were like the world exactly. is ending and then like they sell all their earthly goods and like ride yeah. around in RVs with big signs. Do you remember that Courtney and yes. Boston and Daniel no. too, obviously? I oh, I remember you. seeing the, I remember seeing those in Boston where like there were people driving around like near, near park street who had like the big signs, like the world is ending in 2012 in a couple of days or whatever it is. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. yeah. I met the sandwich guy who has that, you know, but he's not the same one, but he, the sandwich, there's one apocalypse guy in Harvard Square who wore a sandwich board with like all these little. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's like very Jesus y, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very, oh, very yeah. religious. Yeah, yeah. I met him yeah. at a McDonald's once. And I'm like, hey, really? what's up? And he's like, hey. <laughs> well, is it? <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I got to know a lot of the characters when I worked in Park Street because like they would come in to pay their phone bills a lot. And it's like, you get to know them. It's like, <laughs> it's one of those weird, like, hey, I need to pay my phone bill. And they like take out wads of cash and stuff like that. You know, it's like, whatever. It's like, what's his name? Rorsatch? Rorsatch? Rorschach? Rorschach. It's like him showing up to to pay his phone bill <laughs> wearing his sandwich yeah. board. <laughs> yeah. Where else is he going to get a can of beans to eat? Like, uh, yeah, yeah he's got to do regular human things occasionally, mm-hmm. you know? Um, speaking of regular human things, we should we should ask some more questions or move on to our recaps. Um, I have been wondering, like, how how dangerous the sun and dark sides are like oh, i can help are, are you, you there yeah yeah please <laughs> please explain the science <laughs> all i can tell you because again it was 5 a.m <laughs> is, that, is that either side could reach temperatures of negative or positive 100 degrees celsius oh shit what's that to us filthy american fahrenheit let's see 100 degrees let me ask why would i'm gonna calculate wait wouldn't it be 212 because that's the boiling point it is i don't know 212 you're right look at that she did it she knows the science (laughs) well i i just knew because the boiling point is the 100 degrees Celsius. Bernie, you're an official scientist now. Yep. Oh, fuck. I don't want that. Yeah. Good luck. No. You're now in charge of all science from here all on science. out. Oh, God. Yeah, that's all science. Yeah. It doesn't seem so bad. 212, I mean, that's like an oven, right? Uh, not really scary. It doesn't seem so bad. You just die. Daniel, Daniel, what I would like for you to do is go boil water until it hits yeah. 100 degrees and then dip your hand in and tell me I mean, how it feels. You know what, my oven? It's like too tough. I'm like, ah, I could just put my head in here and I won't instantly <laughs> die. This <laughs> it's like, I won't instantly die. Uh, it's Daniel. like when it's hot, breathing a little hot, you know, and it's not even pizza, it's not even pizza temperature, guys. <laughs> you you will be pizza. Yes, yeah. that is correct. <laughs> okay, so in other words, it's very dangerous on both sides. Yes, Seems exactly. Like so wait, okay. we're looking at plus 212 or minus 212 is that what we're suggesting here that seems like according to okay. my bleary Jesus reading. Christ that's cold and also hot at mm-hmm. the same time yeah I think that there's a there's a Jim Gaffigan joke about like magma on the inside frozen on the outside about hot pockets but whatever we're gonna we're gonna move on <laughs> oh my god that, that is so correct <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hate hot pockets for that reason <laughs> <laughs> they're also disgusting <laughs> Daniel really appreciating a, a Jim Gaffigan joke circa 2002. I was yeah. going to say it's like 20 years old. At this point. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely 20 plus years old at this point. So right. Uh, anyway, yeah, okay. So yes, it's extremely dangerous to be in a pizza oven or sub pizza <laughs> oven temperatures, I suppose. <laughs> Especially because, like, that's just ambient temperature. That's probably not including, like, direct sunlight exposure or anything like that, right? I think so. Okay. Gotcha. I don't know. Oh, okay. Another thing that we should probably science. So, Courtney, this is on you. Um, no, is how, how would, like, clouds and, like, climate work with stuff like that exactly? Like, uh, yeah. I remember reading that there are violent storms. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah sand and wind and otherwise yeah I, I, i've been experiencing some crazy storms out here in the midwest recently too got to see what super hail looks like and hopefully <laughs> i'm hoping that i get to see a proper midwestern tornado by the time i'm done with my <laughs> time here in kansas so kansas is basically like a tightly locked planet is what you're saying <laughs> oh, i really hope not because man kansas kind of sucks y'all <laughs> i'm not gonna lie <laughs> um but um, with- I, I, Kinda in some cases, I guess. Like with the 
Hey, okay, we're not getting into it. Go on. What are you going to say, Courtney? With, uh, with the sandstorms, too, thinking like it could also be um, basically glass from the long dead civilization that has been slowly ground down over time. So it's like Ooh, you've got these, gross. yeah, these like glass and like metal storms that occur, too, because oh, yeah. of how worn down those buildings have been. and Rust storms? Hell yeah. Yeah, basically like debris, like yeah. ripping people apart if they're in there at the wrong time. Okay, the idea that there are rust storms, so like red dunes of rust is actually a really cool visual. So I fully support this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait a minute. Does metal work like that? Can metal rust if there's no water? I think it can rust in air, right? Yeah, it's because it's oxidization. oxidization. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. See, this is why Daniel and Courtney handle the science, <laughs> not me. I don't I even am, know. <laughs> I'm not a smart person, you guys. I, I assure you. Okay, so I feel like we're at the point where we should probably go around and recap where we've been. Mm -hmm. So, Courtney, you started us off. So, Daniel, why don't you tell us your <laughs> first tenant this time? Uh, my, what was my first? Oh, that people don't sleep. <laughs> like Daniel. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, very topical. <laughs> yeah. <my> people. <laughs> um, I feel like that really, that hasn't really come up yet, though. Yeah. Like, how can we ensure that that becomes more of a plot point in our story? Oh, oh, I've got an idea. Uh, you guys had mentioned um, like the sunken place and maybe that the sleeping, you go someplace else in your head, mm -hmm. perhaps right. accessing that that place that's on the hot side. Um, you can't do it when you're conscious. Oh, in some way. Oh, that's kind of brutal. Yeah. Oh, and perhaps like there are things to be learned of the previous civilization in that sunken place. Oh, that are like psychically resonant once you get yeah. closer. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. 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 Hold on. We're going to add a step to that, Daniel. So the the I know that I'm jumping the gun here, but the second tenet that you introduced that is the psychic beacon that Ooh. is drawing mm -hmm. people in. So like you navigate yes. via the sunken place because it's calling you while you're in that place. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. And maybe it. maybe in their culture, like they don't really want to sleep. So they take very brief mm -hmm. dips into the sunken place because A, it's kind of scary to them. And B, like maybe they're very industrious, yeah. like and they don't really mm -hmm. they think of it as a distraction, you know. Mm. Yeah. It could Just also like be Daniel like does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could also be like a, a religious thing, like um uh shit, what's it called when you make a journey? You're not supposed to masturbate. Is that like that? Yeah. Pilgrimage is the word. Yes, you're pilgrimage is what I was saying about. Um, not yes. masturbation. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, was not thinking that at all. Um, I was thinking of the Catholic Church, <laughs> who who commit pilgrimages all the time. Yes, exactly, exactly why your brain went there. And Daniel. child you're sexual abuse. Correct. Yes, <laughs> honestly, yeah. I mean, you're not yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Moving on. Just, yes, just imagining like a religious <laughs> pilgrimage type thing, like you have groups of people who maybe are more focused on that sort of so-called spiritual side mm -hmm. and they want to like go to that place because of that they see it as like a holy thing yeah i like that idea a lot because now mm -hmm. you have a mixture of people who much like pitch black mm -hmm. uh, that's true a, yeah. There, yeah yeah there's a mixture <laughs> of like people who are there who are doing it for religious reasons and people who are like traveling for more selfish reasons let's put it that way Mm -hmm. yeah all right um so my first tenet was the reason for this title locking was their own fault they created giant walls mm -hmm. to try and harness tidal currents and that is partially what stopped the uh the rotation of the earth that and apparently they mined the moon to mm -hmm. do it to get the materials which like dumb as hell but god i love that so much now <laughs> like <laughs> Like that's funny as hell and amazing. So yeah, I, I feel like mm -hmm. we've satisfied those tenants pretty or that tenant pretty well. You remind us about the nature of the walls. I mean, yeah, think of them as like hydroelectric dams, right? Like right. but massive in scope in that they're trying to harness tidal currents in order Got to it. Okay. do it. Like super geothermal uh, wall kind of things. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh so Courtney, what was your first tenant? Pitch yes, black, that was right? that was the pitch black inspired. Uh, <laughs> there are eclipses that uh, make it easier for people to, or probably just make it possible at all for people to travel to the mm. sun side of the planet. 
Right. And since there's no moon, those are caused by planets getting between the star and the planet. And usually it's just partial, but there are occasional rare occurrences of total eclipses from planetary alignments. Right. That's really cool. I mm -hmm. like that a lot. Plus, we can probably tie that into like the religious aspect if we ever wanted to. Do yeah, that, you know? yeah. Yeah. Daniel, what was your second tenet? Remind us. There's a um, ancient structure that belongs to the previous civilization that's still functioning, but it's on the hot side. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is definitely something that we need to discover a little bit more. But just the fact yeah. that it also ties into the sunken place travel is also kind of cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, let's kind of see where we go with that in the twist and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I agree. Right. Yeah. Uh, my second tenet was the the Twilight Zone, as uh, Andrew calls it in the middle, is basically built up remarkably tall. So mm -hmm. it's it's thin strips of big civilized cities. Uh, so in my brain, it almost looks like a miniaturized version of the Rings of Saturn, you know, uh, except not, you know scene from space effectively right <laughs> uh yeah and courtney yours directly ties in with mine which is yeah this one was water world inspired where people mm. in that brackish sea live on like rigs and and ships and stuff like that and we right. put those two together to say that yours is the more sparse land-based ones and mine is people closer to the the colder side and they're also traveling between your towers to do trade and, and stuff right. like that. Yeah, we, we've got like Vikings and merchants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Courtney, I just realized this is not the first time, nor even the second time that you've brought up Waterworld on the podcast. Mm -hmm. That's that's correct. Yeah. That, that's so weird to me. I've never <laughs> known anyone to love Waterworld as much as you do. So oh. to be fair, I haven't seen it in many years. It's probably complete trash, but uh -huh. sure. It, As a kid, I loved it. <laughs> sure. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just pointing mm. to it and being like, that's very curious, you know? I'm here for the hot take. <laughs> is it a hot take? I don't think it's that. I mean, it's it, like, I like, like Waterworld. Waterworld is a hot take because it's a terrible movie. <laughs> wow. And, I, okay, and so... I appreciate that you like it, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're we're going to have to have like a, a trio of movies for a movie night where it's just like <laughs> movies from our childhood we barely remember and it'll be like oh God. that yeah. we liked as a kid and barely remember. So like Waterworld, I guess Dragonheart for you would also work, Courtney. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Daniel, we can rewatch Masters of the Universe and see how that holds up. You know, it uh it doesn't hold. It up does not. It. Yeah, except not, for not except good. for what's his name. Skeletor, the guy who plays Skeletor, is the only one oh, who does right. a good job. He's a force of nature. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't get over the fact that it's not the voice from the cartoon because I love the voice from the cartoon. You know, uh, what's funny yeah. is I like, grew up with the movie version, so I never liked the right. one from the from the show cartoon. Right, but it's like such an iconic, yeah, you know, know like that right? kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, All right, so. We, we've got the recap knocked out. Let's go ahead and roll the twist, see what the twist is and see where it gets us. So our twist for this episode is. Oh, boy, this is a weird one. Each person slash character can only feel one emotion. All right. Huh. This one is always like such a weird twist, I think. Yeah, yeah. But the last time we did this, it was, um, I believe it was our prestige television Girl Hitler series. If, <laughs> yes. If memory serves Our lovely correctly. Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> Fascism for her. Yeah. 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 Okay. Again, don't clip those out of context. Make sure. <laughs> we're just tossing that out there. Daniel is shouting his love is, is, is like one of those things that like, oh, uh, thank God Daniel's not running for office. Otherwise his opponents could be like, really? Make it a soundboard, Courtney, where I just say, I love Lady Hitler. You just play whatever you want. Wouldn't that be great? I love it. It'd be uh, wonderful, yes. I fully approve this message. All right. Add it to the blackmail folder. <laughs> Let's go. Um, I, I wonder if that's related to the, the sleep. The lack yes, of sleep. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking too, Courtney. Yeah. Like I don't know how, but somehow. It, it's kind of one of those things where it's just like, oh, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Maybe part of the reason that people dislike being in the sunken place is because it's where they're able to feel multiple emotions yep. at once. Whoa. So it's like this 
overwhelming thing because normally, right? Oh, maybe it's a side effect of them not sleeping, right? It's like their world is so muted by like sleep deprivation or just like the need or whatever that like I'm only able to feel one emotion at a time. And so yeah. when they enter the sunken place and they're like, there's a barrage of like, oh, I'm feeling complex emotions. Oh, I'm feeling all these things all at once that it becomes overwhelming and kind of scary. So like rather mm -hmm. than being muted, which is kind of the assumption when you enter a sunken place, it's the opposite. It's amplification. It's like overstimulation. Mm -hmm. I, I like, like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder too, um, to add on to that, like, because we have two kind of cultures in conflict. Could it be then too that the, um, the Viking ice people and the people in the cities, like they have a different singular emotional mindset they stick to. Mm. So like maybe mm. one is very um, forceful and self-sufficient and the other one is very sure. like, I don't know. like, Or or maybe it's like the primary emotion associated with each of the regions differs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about cultural differences, it's like, oh, those people are angry. It's like, no, they're literally exactly. like, that's the main driving yeah. emotion. That yeah. Have, yeah. You know? Cause then that's perfect. in that like they've, they've out of almost out of partially a reaction to their bodies changing to not need sleep in the same way. They've restricted the, they've been trying to make themselves more, more uh, psychically efficient. Right. And part of mm -hmm. that is getting rid of the emotions you don't need. Yeah. Daniel, having spent the last like three, three to four months in affect theory class, I feel like you have an unhealthy relationship with your emotions. If you feel that way, <laughs> if, if you feel as though some of your emotions are unhealthy and unwanted, then yeah. Just... Well, I was speaking on behalf of the cultures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, felt. yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> no, Daniel, I, I could yes. see that like your brain only has enough energy to like focus uh -huh, okay, on one yeah. thing at a time, yeah. really. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's what's happened over time. That that actually is pretty interesting. Yeah, you're right. crying all the time. You're not going to get anything done, to be honest. <laughs> Come on. If you're always happy. Eventually, you're getting hit by a bus. So you got to be careful with your emotions. <laughs> See, Courtney, this is what I was talking about. We like, yeah, I know that Daniel said he's talking for other cultures, but there's a little bit too much reality in what he mm -hmm. says and how he says it. Yeah, I will not be psychoanalyzed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the I see a therapist is what I'm in my coffin. He, yes, again, this is what I'm getting at, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> uh, um, so then maybe the maybe the religious people are I mean, obviously they're probably more open to the multi-emotional yes. state yes. if they're seeking that out. And also like I'm wondering what emotions they experience on like a typical day to day. Like they must be different in some way than the yeah. others. I imagine that like just being able to experience multiple emotions throughout a journey is also kind of revelatory. Like there's like, Oh wow. I feel so much more connected with multiple people because it's, yeah. you know, this culturally constructed thing where it's like, I'm able to feel these things based on the people I know, you know, that kind of thing. It gives me Dune vibes. I've never read or seen Dune Daniel. So I couldn't. Oh really? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, all I know about Dune is like from you and Jodorowsky's Dune and that's it, you know? To give you, I mean, I guess to give people who haven't maybe haven't read it either, um, it reminds me of the Bene Gesserit a little bit. Like they're, they're in, a, in a sense kind of very in tune with their emotions and they use it to manipulate others through mm -hmm. their power, through their voice. Fear is the mind killer, right? Yeah. Like that's, like, that's from Dune, right? Yeah. And also like the whole, you know, burning desert side yeah, and the pilgrimages mm. we're talking about make me think of the jihad and dude and all that mm. oh okay hold on i just realized something by the way by separating affect from like regions we're effectively creating seasonal yeah. like emotion <laughs> disorder but like yeah. on a region like yeah. 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 like traveling from place to place is like Oh, uh, like it's the desert of sadness, <laughs> like the desert seas of, of anger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Except, except it's like all of the emotions at once, you know, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting, actually. Um, yeah. I don't know how we would handle that on like a world building scale, but it is pretty interesting. Would you say that that's reconciled? Because I feel like that's pretty easily reconciled. I right think there. so. It feels yeah. good. And I feel like from that, like we have a lot of factions to work with now, too. Well, I, I suppose the question should be now, right? Are we developing a, a new faction or are there any factions that are currently in play that we really desperately want to like dive into a little bit more? Um, I'd be cool rolling randomly for something new. Yeah. 
All right, let's do that then. I'm, I'm more excited to do that. So the theme of our faction is going to be, ooh, that's a nat 20. And the theme, when you hit a nat 20, by the way, dear listeners, is death. So <laughs> we've got death as our theme. And the thing that this faction is centered around is the rise of a new era. So the theme is death. The thing that the faction is focusing on is the rise of a new era. This sounds like a revolution to me, like an active or, or painful death or something like that. I don't know. What do y'all think? Um, For some reason with death, I still went to like a religious sort of thing. Like, oh, yeah. If it's, if it's a group that lives permanently in the sunken place. Ooh. And I wonder like. If death is related to why it's so psychically strong there, like if that was a a place of a ton of death before uh, mm -hmm. the fall of the ancient civilization, oh. and like because of that, there's all this psychic energy that's been trapped there. Okay, I've got I've got kind of an idea. If death is the focus, and if they're more in in line to like want to explore the kind of sun bleached areas that are mm -hmm. almost certain death. Maybe what they're really interested in is getting as close to death as possible. Mm -hmm. And by doing yeah. so, it, it, it illuminates some aspect within themselves, right? So they're constantly seeking that kind of enlightened, sunken place, uh, emotional, affective state, right? Mm -hmm. So they make frequent pilgrimages into it to try and like build up a tolerance and try and make sure that they can experience death as closely as possible, right? And so... Maybe you're right, Cordy. Maybe the the thing that beckons to them in the sunken place, that kind of sun bleached citadel that Daniel created early on, like maybe that's the thing that's drawing them to it. Maybe it is mm -hmm. some greater like beacon of death, and maybe that's what these religious folks are kind of seeking. Oh, I'm wondering now if that place was the site of like a mass suicide when the planet started to to fall apart. Like there was a, a massive group there that mm -hmm. kind of did a, a Jonestown type situation sure. because they thought that the world was going to completely end and that this was their only way out. And that's why there's so much psychic energy locked there is because sure. thousands and thousands of people died at once there. I am mm -hmm. down for a Jonestown level tragedy for mm -hmm. sure. I think that it focuses on on death a lot for sure. I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it's it's sufficiently dark. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But but remember that we're focusing on the rise of a new era, yeah. and I think that we should make sure that that is a big part of it as well. Daniel, what do you think that we can do to kind of reconcile the rise of a new era for this particular faction that we're building so far? So. Um... I guess it depends on what they wanted. I mean, obviously they wanted to die, but now that they're psychically attached to this space, mm -hmm. what's their desire? Um, so let me just recap what the things are here. We've got the the thing in the desert is the site of a mass suicide prior to this cataclysm. Mm -hmm. And we know or shortly that after the cataclysm. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, exactly. Right. So like as a consequence of it. And the psychic resonance reaches out to people in the sunken place. And there's a religion that rose up around that fact, right? Mm -hmm. And the people who are into that religion are more in tune with their emotions, whereas the two cultures, having evolved differently, try to avoid the sleep you know, state. And so mm -hmm. they don't really have the same emotions. And there's eclipse-based pilgrimages out mm -hmm. to find things out there. We know the alignment, the planner alignment, um, is a key to getting there. So this new, to answer your question, so this new era must be something in connection with what these sunken minds want. Could it be like, like this religious faction is trying to amplify the psychic state oh. to, to spread it over the world so that other people to can experience everyone be in the sunken state. That's what we're saying. Or to push everybody to experience more emotions at once. Like right. rather yeah. than be limited, they, they feel that it's their, their duty to like help others experience this state of actually being able to feel multiple mm. things. Yeah, yeah. And and maybe like maybe push it to eleven. Maybe say <laughs> it's not just experiencing it, but make them be in that state. 
mm. of total emotion, which is to go to the sunken place. Right. Like flip the polarity, make the planet spin again, basically. Oh uh, yeah. Oh well, that would make sense. Yeah, I was actually. Yeah, would, yeah. yeah, I was literally just about to chime in and be yeah. like, "Make the planet spin." You set this up in like minute two of yeah. like the ultimate goal or the easy goal is to like make it so the planet spins again. You know, like hey, to, yeah. to create this kind of harmony. And I think that what we've done as well, metaphorically, we've created like delineations geographically that also represent delineations or or like stark lines of emotionality and affect right which i think mm -hmm. is kind of interesting as well like we we've subconsciously created these barriers uh geographically and metaphorically that also mimic emotion and stuff like that so that's pretty cool that we have kind of created and crafted this thing as we've gone on you know mm -hmm. um i like the idea as well that up until this point, no one has been able to reach the sun bleached citadel and mm. the sun bleached citadel also has the answer to return polarity and rotation to the earth once more. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Maybe it was like the, the sort of scientific center of that project and mm. the people that committed suicide were the, all the scientists who had caused that to happen. Well, yeah. They're like, well, fuck this. Yeah. Oh, and so that, that's also interesting as well, because it suggests that it's not just the geographic, you know, difficulty to get there that has been preventing people. It's mm -hmm. also the, you know, the haunted nature, this kind of traumatic, you know, like it, it's been seen not just as a place that is physically dangerous to get to, but also a place that is emotionally and perhaps mm -hmm. like religiously dangerous to explore because it's a tomb at this point right it is it is both a tomb to and monument to the failure of the species in this way mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah and it's like it could be a thing where like if you're not attuned to those emotions if you haven't sort of inoculated yourself by exposing yourself here and there like if you just go there and you've never experienced that before you get driven mm. mad because it's so much for your mind to handle oh yeah so so the cult is there trying to create like you have to be emotionally attuned and able to process all of these emotional responses yeah. right? Yeah. yeah because otherwise it does drive you mad it does drive you into this fervor or fury or maybe maybe that's what it does that is like it takes whatever singular emotion and spikes it to mm. not just 11 daniel but a 12 oh damn you well wow. so if you're wow. if you manifest anger then it's like this berserker's fury right if it's sadness then it's this deep melancholy that is like it saps your ability to move you know mm -hmm. and if it's joy then everyone knows that you're just fucking constantly, right? Like at that point, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, like whatever emotion it is, whatever emotion it chooses to spike, it cranks the knob off and snaps the knob, you know, like that's what it's happening. Mm -hmm. And so mastering emotion in the way of being able to experience and process them is also really fucking fascinating. So I'm down with that entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. All right. We've done it. We've created a whole ass world, you guys. We've we've managed to figure it out. We've knocked out the main storyline, the faction, all of the tenets, and we even managed to twist. Hell <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Never half ass the world, only whole ass it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. In context of this world, what you're suggesting is the cold side is one cheek, the hot side yes, is another cheek. You're right. And the ring mm -hmm. civilization is the crack. It's the cheek. Oh my Those god! You gotta, you yeah. gotta get horrible. right in there all the way. Horrible. <laughs> Obviously, really horrible. yes. What a what a banger way to go out on this episode, <laughs> Daniel. Thank you so much uh, uh, for that, sir. I deeply appreciate it. God damn it! Uh, and I know I was only gone for one episode, but boy, does it feel good to be back. So. That's going to do it for this episode of World Build With Us. Uh, remember that if you want us to build your world, like our new prompted listener, Andrew, a big thank you again to Andrew for this prompt. You can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, where you can click the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. 
If you want to follow us on social media, you can always go to our Twitter at Let's World Build. Or if you want to come and chat with us more directly, you can join our Discord. Of course, if you're feeling particularly generous, you can always go to our Patreon, where you'll get access to sweet, sweet patron-only goodies like double-length episodes on any prompt that you send in. Uh, oh, we got Too Hot for Broadcast. We got patron-only episodes known as the Aphid Lounge. Uh, w- w- oh, we've got other stuff in there, too, but I'm just blanking on it because I've been away for ever so long. Anyway, let's go ahead and wrap it up. That's going to do it for this episode of World Build With Us. Remember that we love you very much. We're going to get through this together. Until next week. 